Uh, you have uh, arrived at session two uh, of our new faculty orientation uh, on faith integration. Uh, session one was the stuff that we did in talking about the definition of faith integration at the uh, new faculty orientation in August. So we're going to continue and talk this year about our eight competencies. Now, recently people have said to me they don't like that word competency. It sounds all too technocratic and such. I'm comfortable with that word, but if you'd rather put the word disposition or virtue or ability or skill or passion in there, that's all fine with me, right? Talking to academics about cho choosing words becomes a very precarious kinds of enterprise. And so fill in the blank as it's comfortable to you. So this is uh, our second uh, discussion related to competency. And we've got the disciplinary competency related to faith integration. So let me define that for you here. Uh, we say that this is the ability to identify the discipline-specific questions, connections, opportunities, challenges, habits of mind, practices, etc., etc., themes and resources, the kinds of things in your discipline that are available for relevant and appropriate use to achieve unique discipline-oriented academic faith integration objectives. So I sometimes put my tongue in my cheek here and say, I know we told you that APU is a God-first university, but when it comes to faith integration, it's God-second. Your discipline is the thing that, that starts the conversation, and it's where you look for opportunities. And then the question is, how do we recognize opportunities within that? So before we get too specific on that competency, I want to invite you to have some conversation uh, around the article, uh, that the chapter that you may have had a chance to read, and maybe you just skimmed it on your way over here. I get that. Uh, but that's why talking in groups can be a valuable thing. So I'm going to invite you uh, to move into some conversations with the people around you. And uh, Connie's going to give you a handout that has uh, some questions on the front page uh, around that article. So if you could get in groups of two or three, get that article in the middle of you. And I'm going to give you about 12 or 14 minutes just to highlight some things about the article. You, you won't get through all these questions. That's fine. But hopefully, uh, the questions that are there, you can look them over. Will inspire some ways to reflect uh, on what the beers have helped us to understand here. Okay, so I'll let you do that for about 12 minutes, 13 minutes, and then I'll regather us. Well, I hope that uh, uh, the beers got you started in this. I would encourage you as a follow-up to read the Hasker article that they refer to. Um, so uh, Saul and I were talking about uh, seminal thinkers in this thing called faith integration, and William Hasker's uh, would be one of those. And so his article is often the first place that we send people. This one kind of covered more of the broad landscape, so that's why I've chosen this one now. But I encourage you to look at Hasker, and it's kind of a map. You can isolate uh, where you think you might be uh, in working on this and developing your own framework. Okay. All right, so let's talk about some dispositions for faithful uh, disciplinary engagement. And I want to start with the story uh, that you probably are familiar with, the story of, of Jesus hanging out in the temple with, uh, with these uh, wise religious leaders. And I start with that because sometimes we as Christian scholars, this may not be true of you, I know it has been true of me, can feel small and intimidated in the big world of scholarship where all these brainy people who sometimes look down on us as you know narrow Christians and and uh, not having a lot to offer because of our parochial kind of perspectives on knowledge and such and so sometimes I feel uh, like this guy and and, and put it in, in perspective when you think about uh, Jesus there uh, in the temple think about him uh, in this way as a 12 year old right I mean, think of a junior higher. So I have a 13-year-old who's older than Jesus would have been at the time. And, you know, cap, you know, turn around cap, skateboard, you know, just, just a total kid. And yet somehow he, he was with these great thinkers and he earned their respect. Let's go back to the story. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem they were unaware of it, thinking he was in their company. They traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, standing among the teachers. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his insights and his assertions, right? So something amazing occurred there in that encounter that Jesus had with these people. And, uh, and the story gives us a clue, although I've altered the story because I want to draw some things to your attention here. Uh, so the, the, this picture here has him doing what this particular interpretation says standing, and yet that's not what he was doing. If you look, you'll see here, uh, a better picture of how Jesus postured himself among the, the great religious leaders. And here's what I altered and took out. He was, after three days 
in the temple courts, I had taken this out, he was in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And as a result of that, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. So Ed Barron and I teach leadership and uh, often leaders are asked to lead leaders, right? How do you as a leader lead leaders? How do you, how do you gather among peers who are so knowledgeable in their field like you and, and feel like you can uh, offer something? It starts by this humble posture. He joined them in their world, and so for us, it's the reminder to stay deeply immersed in your discipline, to continue to become an expert in your field. What are people talking about? What are they, what are they working on? To sit among them, that posture of humility, not to be what they may perceive us to be, those uh, disinterested Christian uh, people who think we've got a corner on the market of truth and unwilling to gather in their circles and read their literature and listening to them and asking them thoughtful questions. So, so this is just a reiteration, I hope, of what you're already committed to, and that is to being engaged in your field, deeply engaged, to, to be at the conferences, to be reading the literature, to be up on the latest theories. Christian scholars need not think that I better make sure that I'm up on all the theology at the expense of, of this. This is what you love. This is what you're called to. This is what the university wants you to do. And being that kind of person is the foundation to faith integration. I like this, this picture. I haven't studied it enough to know about its credibility, but it's a good m illustration that when we are, are sort of on hovering as teacher-student, that's the place where, where we're going to learn most. And uh, that we be models of those kinds of people uh, in our study and in our attention to work that's being done. So what does that look like then? Well, engaging our discipline on its own turf. This is a translation of the Luke story uh, for us. Taking a humble posture of a learner to learn well the insights and opinions of the founding thinkers, leading voices, as well as the significant presuppositions or assumptions in our field. To ask intelligent questions of the discipline, the practice, and of the extant literature and then to be ready to demonstrate our understanding and our answers. And that will give us credibility. And our students need to get that too. Some of you will find that students come with ready-made Christian answers that they may, as young people, have inherited, and they want to quickly trump every questionable thing with Jesus, right? What the Bible says. And I always say, so I'm, I'm teaching a class right now, and I'm going to leave right from here to go to teach a class. And I, I always say, we got to let this text speak for itself, understand it, really, really understand it. Then we can begin to respond to it uh, appropriately. That's an adjustment for, for some of them who come uh, from a good Christian background to do that. So that looks kind of like this in terms of dispositions, the kinds of persons that we want to be uh, as we proceed uh, in faith integration. Uh, so some of you um, might know about uh, Ken Bain, and uh, I put on the front page of the handout that I gave you uh, his book called, uh, is it called What Cr Great Teachers? What, what the Best College Teachers Do. What the Best College Teachers Do. Who's read that? Anybody here? A couple of you? It's a really wonderful book for those of you who haven't. I really commend it. It's inspiring, great stories, great principles, very practical and useful. We gave it to all the faculty about seven or eight years ago uh, and encouraged reading groups to, to emerge out of it. Uh, Ken Bain says, the best teachers have an unusually keen sense of the histories of their disciplines, including the controversies that have swirled within them. And that understanding seems to help them reflect deeply on the nature of thinking within their field. So this is one of the things the best teachers do. Uh, the the uh, Jacobsons uh, at Messiah College, so from a faith-based perspective, say individuals who hope to be truly excellent Christian scholars will have to work at developing the natural connections that already exist between their faith and their learning, or you could put discipline there. They will need to carefully explore those connections through self-reflection as well as conversation with, with others. So if you could uh, look on the, uh, towards the back of that handout, that I, I put this together uh, as, a, as a way to visualize some of what I'm suggesting. It's where it says a model for generative dialogue. It comes from a very nice book by William Isaacs on dialogue. And, uh, and you can see sort of the, the way this begins to work out as we get into conversation with others. So, so conversation is one metaphor for faith integration. We're bringing our discipline and our faith into conversation with each other. And if we do that well and thoughtfully, it will lead to some deliberation. And then over 
over time, we're going to have to uh, suspend judgment and listen. We're going to have to defend our views. And we're going to be moving close. The, the aim here, of course, is closer and closer to a deeper understanding of truth as informed by the Christian faith. We do not leave the Christian faith out of the conversation like they're going to do in many places. And this gives us a sort of visual of how that might begin to work itself out in our work. Use this uh, or not. Uh, share this with students uh, or not, but it's a way to see how conversation is our aim. Uh, while I talk about this next piece, I'm going to send around a few books. Um, some of the things uh, that I get to do are help people identify sources in different areas of study that can be useful to them in faith integration. These are the kinds of books you may decide you're interested, but it's more people like me that are interested that think across disciplines because they ha these have chapters on many different areas, right? So it has maybe your area, maybe not. I'm not sure all of your areas, um, but uh, selections from thoughtful people, Christian people. This one is a, from the Catholic tradition, the top one, uh, who've, who've been interested and how Christian faith comes together with these uh, different areas of study. So I think we have most of these in our library, so you might go find a chapter that interests you. And of course, there's whole books that are on different topics, but this is kind of fun to look at how these ideas cross the discipline. So we'll just kind of send those around. You can take a look if you like uh, as we go. So let's talk about disciplines uh, and the way they're organized. And I'm probably preaching to people who've done study on this and you're thoughtful in this regard. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm doing this now is because you'll hear us say this way. We say less at APU faith and learning because we're interested in getting to the specific connection between our faith and our discipline. So learning uh, often connotes in our mind uh, a process of coming to understand. And uh, we are interested in how that works out uniquely in light of Christian faith. Uh, but we want to say what is the connection to our area of, uh, of, of study, uh, our field, um, uh, our, our area of professional understanding. So let me give you th these categories. So um, discipline here is, is, is a part of the overall structuring of this, but there's other areas, uh, other ideas that are, come together in this, how disciplines, they contain things and they're contained by things. So others may define this differently, but I want you to know that when we think of faith integration, we're really glad if you make connections to a broader field. Um, so we don't use most of these words in the way we define our disciplines, but you might see a connection for you here. Um, so if somebody's preparing for ministry or going into technology, healthcare, or the helping professions, uh, or some aspect of business or entertainment. So what's the field in which you're preparing your students to go? And maybe there's a variety of fields, right? Calm Studies is going to have a variety of applications, media and, uh, and different places, consulting that people might go into. So, so beginning to think broadly about the field in which students will leave and enter as a result of being with you is one connection meaningfully to faith integration. Because you're saying, okay, if they're going to be uh, Christian professionals in this field, if they have a vocational uh, calling to a, a, an area, then how can the Christian faith be a part of informing them to make a difference in that area? Okay? So disciplines have a history. So do you know when your discipline began? Uh, do you know who some of its uh, founding theorists were? Did I put that here? Founding theorists, what are the, some of the seminal works uh, in your discipline might have been. Uh, could you define broadly what the aims of your discipline are? Uh, methodologies, core assumptions, subjects, themes, topics. And uh, this is where our mind most goes uh, as people who've got advanced degrees in our areas is sort of the big understanding of our discipline. And it's important at the level of, of teaching that we're involved with that we have a sense of that, that we understand kind of how we got here uh, in our professional area. Faith integration might want to take some of these on. So if you're in psychology, then a Freud is going to have some of the seminal works and maybe from a Christian perspective you want to interact a little bit with Freud because uh, there might be some things there that you want to challenge or, or uh, find validation for. Uh, some core assumptions in, in terms of human nature and stuff in different disciplines uh, might be the kinds of things that you want to look more deeply at and figure out how you might want to respond to. Now we'll get there down the line when we talk about pedagogical competencies, but then 
the decision becomes, how do I work this out with my students? What choices do I make in my classroom uh, in terms of uh, faith integration and the, the class that they're with me to learn? So special or sub-disciplines might be things like this. So you'll see I've, I've uh, capitalized the discipline. Uh, so education is the discipline. But then there are sub-disciplines around it, right? So you might be a philosopher, but you might have a, a, an area of commitment to the philosophy of mind. You might be a historian, but this might be your area, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, some of our faculty have felt like the only place that faith integration is valid is here in these sub-disciplines. Uh, in the smallest place, maybe, of their area of interest. But we want to say, yes, I mean, become faith integration kinds of people in that, but there might be uh, other ways to make a connection as well. And uh, so, yeah, so here, uh, this sometimes shows up a three-tiered taxonomy of disciplines. So we got engineering, biomedical engineering and bioengineering, other biomedical engineering and bioengineering, systems and integrative engineering. So from a faith integration perspective, as you uh, map, align yourself on where uh, you feel like your greatest areas of contribution and interest are, it's, it's all fair game in faith integration. And then there's specialty areas, which might include your research agenda, your professional experience, uh, particular classes that you teach where they have a sort of specialty orientation. Um, that might be another place uh, to make some faith integration connections. Ed, are you teaching the class on leader as agent of change? Is that so you may get this, get this class, right? Yeah. So change would be one of those specialty areas within leadership studies where Ed and I uh, hang out. Um, great opportunity for faith integration. So as you think about the, the opportunities, this is a way to begin to orient around that. So um, why don't you talk about this for a few minutes. I, did I put it as a question uh, in here? Um, it's a different kind of question, but I'm interested in you kind of uh, talking about these kinds of things. How does this expanded perspective of academic disciplines open up new possibilities for academic faith integration for you? The questions here, uh, if you had a simple map of your discipline, uh, where would your scholarly location be on it? What additional faith integration opportunities does this open up for you? Thinking about it this way, okay? So if you could just chat for a couple of minutes with each other about how you see yourself orienting in, in this respect, that would be great. Give you about three or four minutes just for a quick chat on this. Okay, uh, let's, so let's get to the nitty gritty um, and as it relates to disciplines, I want you to see this. Uh, I'm going to uh, re remind you of, of, of four orienting tasks that faith integration uh, utilizes that I would encourage you right now to begin to utilize in your thinking and in your preparation uh, for, your, uh, for your work. And, and the reason I do this is because I want you to have a clear perspective of where you're going, not just professionally, but as it relates to uh, the, uh, the promotion and contract process, right? So I want to tell you upfront um, how this works so that you can be prepared for three years from now when Connie and I will send you an email that says, this is your year to write a faith integration paper and what's involved in that, okay? Because these four orienting tasks are the four questions uh, that the, the, the faith integration response paper, affectionately known as the FERP, uh, gets at, okay? So getting us together to see the same thing about how that works in, in faculty, uh, faculty evaluation system, FES, uh, is a good thing, I think, at the beginning, instead of pulling it on you later, okay? I, I, did I, I didn't show this to you, did I, at, or, at orientation in August? Does this look familiar? Okay, well, I'm good. I'm going to reiterate it and then make sure you see how it fits, okay? So the big idea of faith integration, and these are things in the first part of the process that it's important that you get a clear sense on. That's why I had you read Beers and Beers, why I encourage you to read Hasker, is to say, what is faith integration? Today we've been talking about this question of uh, affirming that it's disciplinary. Sometimes the mistake that faculty make when they're uh, trying to put this all together is they talk about faith integration and they quote Hasker and they quote Beers, they quote all these great people, but they forget to make the connection to how it relates to their discipline. And because we recognize it as not merely a personal, spiritual, uh, testimonial kind of experience, it's something that happens in the academic context, making clear how you think of that from as an 
intellectual enterprise, even if your discipline uh, is an area that's very uh, personally oriented, psychology or whatever it might be, it's still we're working in this setting, we're working with academic materials and reminding ourselves how that works at APU. So then that first part, uh, how does my faith inform my discipline? So what's my faith? People often ask, whose faith are you referring to? Well, you sign a statement of faith that's fairly generic at APU, so that uh, is one place to go back to. But then uh, we respect at APU your particular faith tradition. So you come from a Presbyterian tradition, a Catholic tradition, a Pentecostal tradition, a Wesleyan tradition. That's great. And if those things have in some way informed your thinking, uh, what your faith might be, then bring that in to the conversation. Don't feel like you have to exclude that. If on the other hand you have what would be called a generic uh, evangelical or generic Catholic uh, perspective or orthodox perspective, that's fine too. Uh, it's an opportunity to work with the particulars of what's important in your faith, which may be very committed to social justice, may be committed to an intellectual tradition, may be connected, connected to the works of the, the Holy Spirit. That's great, right? So how does that then work into the connection with your discipline? And we've unpacked how that can be understood broadly. So, so this is the one that people get, get tripped up on because sometimes what ends up happening is we get 2 and 2, 2A and 2B. <laughs> because sometimes people just, without paying attention carefully, think of this part as just more of that first part. So I'd like you to talk for just a couple of minutes about this. I want to stop right here because I want to leave it where we're at. Um, and let's just talk together. Okay, let's, let's all get in on this conversation as, as a large group. What are some examples, if you'd be willing to risk throwing out an example that you have in mind or, or could conceive of in your discipline, broadly understood, where your discipline has something to say to inform your understanding or practice of faith? Okay, thank you. I hope you're, you're seeing this. So the last part uh, is putting it together. How do you, in your teaching and in your scholarship, do that? This is the practical part of it, okay? So now let me show you the faculty handbook, just to see the way this translates. Uh, faculty handbooks change from years to years, but this is the current faculty handbook, so you just get a visual of how this translates, okay? So uh, in our faculty handbook, we have a faith integration section. And there is this discussion of the submission requirements for extended contract. So when you are pursuing your first three-year contract, uh, you'll be uh, invited to write a faith integration response paper. And here it is. Part one is a conceptual understanding. Describe your understanding of academic faith integration as defined uh, in the beginning of the handbook, the definition I gave you uh, in August, and its relationship to your discipline. Then, how does the Christian faith or your particular Christian tradition inform the way you understand and or practice uh, your academic discipline? Describe how your academic discipline informs matters or practices in the Christian faith uh, or your particular discipline, right? Going both ways. And then uh, provide a narrative, so the practical, uh, examples of what faith integration looks like in your faculty role. And here's some prompts, you don't need to address all of these when the time comes, but some ways to begin to think about what you might say. This is a 10 page essay. 3,500 words. You could start writing it today and have uh, a draft of it you know, done by the end of the semester and then tweak it over the next few years, you're ready to go. Okay? The faculty who get started on this now and have locked into their mind these things have no problem uh, moving forward on this. Questions or comments you have about that? Yep. What do you do with the papers? So the papers come to, come to our office and we blind them, Connie in particular, at this season in our life uh, blinds the papers and so they're uh, um, not identified uh, with your name and then they go to two reviewers and we have reviewers who are from uh, the different schools and, and across the, the university so we have about 10 or 12 reviewers and they use a rubric uh, which is in our faculty guidebook um, I can show you that sometime as well uh, and they evaluate the paper and score it on a scale of one to five the first time you write this paper, as a faculty member at APU, you're only required to get a two, and uh, every time thereafter, a three. Uh, and the reason for that is because, and we call three proficient, uh, we want our faculty to be proficient in this. We hope that some will be advanced and, and experts uh, along the way. Um, but we think it's fair that by your sixth year here, uh, you be considered proficient in faith integration. So then you'll get feedback and, and results to that, and then that goes into the process of your new contract. 
Thanks for asking that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about what, where does this fall in? So for promotion, so you need to do this for promotion, but for promotion we also ask for a scholarly something. So depending on your discipline, and I love having conversations with people about what that might look like depending on your area, because in the arts it's going to look differently than in education, than in psychology and science. You know, um, So the handbook also describes that, I didn't put this up here for now, but following this material right here in the handbook is a description on the options for that. And uh, it's not something that has to be published. We will say it will appear publishable in the sense of its polish, you know, it's ready to go in a professional sense, um, and that it demonstrates that you're doing faith integration in your scholarship related to your discipline. So that's a short answer. When the time comes, I'd, I'd love to talk more specifically. Yeah. And some people want to start that now. I'm open to those conversations anytime. So, uh, I want to tell you one other thing that I want to ask you to do between now and the time we finish in December. But this is just a preview for next time we're together. We'll talk about the scholarly competency. Uh, but we're going to talk about ways you can find and use uh, scholarship uh, in our university libraries and other places that will help you with this. And I'm trying to get Michelle, uh, one of our theology libraries, to come and join us and talk to you about some of the tools she's developed. Okay. Okay, so here's what I want you to do as an assignment. Uh, you know, think of it assignment loosely. Um, I'm not um, um, sanctioned to give you an assignment and expect it back, but this is an assignment that I believe will help move you forward uh, in, in this process. And I think I gave in the handouts that I gave you, there is a thing that says portfolio on here. So here's the way it starts. Um, think about these elements that there's a collection, a reflection, a collection, a selection, a reflection, and then a project uh, that emerges. And, and the thing I want you to do as a start is the simplest thing in the world, but it will help you so much, I promise you, is to open up your computer and create a folder and call it Faith Integration. Right there uh, on, on your desktop of your computer as a place just to begin to dump stuff. So what kinds of stuff might you dump? So this is the collect stage of the portfolio process. Uh, if you find a book on Amazon that you think you might be interested in, cut and paste the title and the URL from the Amazon thing and throw it on a Word document and then you've got a reminder, okay, that's a, that's a book I thought might be interested, interesting for me. Uh, sources you'd like to consult. Maybe you found something in the library, or if you're like me, I'm always copying the covers of books. I find a book, somebody else had it, <laughs> I cover, copy the cover of the book, and I'll throw that in my uh, faith integration uh, folder online. Uh, descriptions of course-related assignments. So maybe you have had, maybe you had two or three or four ideas for an assignment. Uh, you got a word document out, just give a quick description of it. You may or may not be using it right away, but it's a trigger to say here's something that that I, I want to consider. Uh, how you've used texts and readings, uh, a little, sort of a journal you might put in class, uh, insights, discussions, aha moments. Sometimes people say, the best faith integration moments for me are the non-structured ones. Uh, and I'm going to encourage you to be structured, but I also deeply respect that you have moments that occur that were beautiful examples of faith integration. So take six minutes write two or three paragraphs just quickly in a little journal kind of place, put it in that, in that folder. Uh, how about exemplars that you find in your field that you think, oh my gosh, I didn't know this person was a Christian. Yeah, look at what they're, they're I got to look their stuff up and, and uh, see if they can help me further. Uh, discipline specific faith integration scholarship, you download an article uh, from EBSCO or whatever, put the PDF uh, in there, okay? So you're collecting things. And then uh, you begin to reflect on things. Now you notice I put student feedback in parentheses here. Um, student feedback is often more encouraging than it is particularly uh, guiding in terms of uh, carrying out faith integration. Okay? So uh, I love to receive student notes. That means a lot to me. Um, but when they say, um, students might say, that was a very inspiring faith integration moment, I sometimes step back and say, was I doing faith integration there or was I just trying to inspire them? And sometimes there's a difference. So, just note to self. Um, so as you're reflecting, you begin to put some of those conceptual understandings here. You might have a Word document that's called task number three. How does my discipline inform my faith? And you might have a conceptual insight there that you want to put something down. And then you're going to go back and look at that when you write your FERP or when you're preparing a class. Um, commentary on decisions made in faith integration. You know, Here's why I decided to do this book 
rather than this book. And that might be useful in your practical application section. Uh, there was three or four great books that I thought about using, but I chose to use this one. Here's what I did with it in my class, and here's how my students used it, and here's how faith integration result, uh, resulted. What works? Uh, what impacts are being made, uh, deeper insights you're reflecting, and that could be some stuff you almost could cut and paste as you then get ready to write that for paper. Oops, so select. So ultimately, you might have way more stuff than you can use uh, in that in that FERP, and that's great, right? I'd rather have more stuff to use than, than not enough stuff to use. And so this is about choosing the things that will provide the clearest way for me to articulate my understanding and approach to faith integration. What will be the clearest way to demonstrate how my faith informs my discipline and how my discipline informs my faith? What will be most compelling uh, in the practical application? Um, I love it when faculty say, I'm really frustrated because I do so much faith integration and I don't have room for it in 10 pages. It's like, great. Pick the best of and uh, tell the story of how you're involved in doing that and what's working with you and with your students. That's, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, so that is going to then become what I just showed you, the FERP with those different parts. People ask how many sources uh, are required. We don't have a number. Uh, because from discipline to discipline, that varies, right? Some disciplines will have lots of opportunities to, to draw on sources and some will have less. So there's not a number. We do ask sources be used so that it shows the scholarly connection to be well used, to be cited appropriately. Uh, write a good paper. Write a readable, good paper and, and you'll be fine. Okay? So uh, what I want to ask from you when, in our last meeting in December is to, is to tell us a bit about your folder. Okay? Uh, I don't expect you to have a ton in it, but tell us what's in it. How did you design your folder? What, what kind of categories were in there? What kind of things did you find important? That will help the rest of us. Uh, tell us what you were able to incorporate in that folder, that portfolio in your first semester. And however this works for you, write a description of your plan for faith integration competency going forward from the time that we're done here uh, with our time in December. Okay. So those are some suggestions, and uh, that's sort of how I anticipate the next uh, three months of us being together going, uh, covering the competencies, and you're doing some of this kind of thing, and then we'll discuss it and celebrate it at the end, okay? Any questions, thoughts, comments, things I could clarify? Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.